Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the ways of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Amos chapter 5. Amos was a herdsman by profession and a prophet by God's call. During a time of great prosperity in the northern kingdom of Israel, the prophet speaks to the wealthy upper class. He warns his listeners that fulfilling God's demand for justice brings blessing, while corruption and oppression incur God's wrath. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel, with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from the, feet, from the Levi's of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 4. We cannot hide our thoughts, desires, and actions from God, to whom we are completely accountable. Nevertheless, Jesus understands our human weakness and temptations, because he also experienced them. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace to receive divine mercy from Christ. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. I will now invite you to stand as you are able, as we celebrate together the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Jesus has been teaching his disciples about what is most valued in God's eyes. Now a conversation with a rich man brings his message home to the disciples in a way that is surprising but unforgettable. 
As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. And Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God, for God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, with persecutions, and the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. I invite you to be seated. And grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have never known poverty. I wouldn't know it if I tried. I've seen it, I can imagine it, but I have to be honest with myself, I've never missed a meal. I have no idea what it means to go without every day of my life has been provided for in some way. Every day of my life has been rich with with gifts, with God's gifts and with the gifts of this world. I live each day with more than enough. I'm comfortable. And I may, I may struggle in life. We all have our struggles, but none of my struggles do, are due to a lack of possessions. I would say that many of my struggles have to do with too many possessions. And being overburdened Buy them. Possessions can be a problem all on their own. Now, would I describe myself as rich? Well, let me put it to you this way. Both of my grandparents grew up during the Great Depression. This is when, this was when they came of age. And This was a time, this was a time when many people in America had to take a long look at what it truly meant to have nothing and to be truly deprived of everything that they had. And my grandfather, my grandfather would tell me that he had two sets of clothes. He had the clothes that he wore during the week 
whether he was to go to work or he was to go to school. And at the end of the week, he would hang those clothes up and he would put on his church clothes. And that was it. He had nothing else. Or I think of my grandmother who grew up on a farm. And if they wanted clothes, they made them. If they wanted food, they grew it. Um, remember my grandmother telling me about one night when she, uh, with a, a broken piece of, I think it was a broken piece of lantern, she maimed part of her finger. And she never knew because it was so, so cold. And, um, and by the way, for anyone out there who knew Helen Wills, that was why her handwriting was so terrible. Because of this injury for when she was a girl. She could hold a sewing needle, though. Her entire life, she could hold a sewing needle. And she could still use, use her talents for sewing, for painting. And that's how they grew up. That, and I don't know if they considered this, was this deprivation? No, this was, it was their lives. And they, they grew up from, it was, and then, you know, the Great Depression, which then led to World War II, which was, but that was rationing, and that was victory gardens, and there was still so much of a time of going without. You know, I think of all of the comforts in this world, all the comforts that I have, this is something I cannot, I cannot, e I cannot even imagine. Now, I say all of this to give our gospel from Mark context, because this is a very, this is a very difficult, very difficult lesson. It's difficult for me, and and in order to explore this lesson. And in order to explore what Jesus is trying to teach us, this is when I, I take this lesson and I, I point it directly at myself. I try to imagine myself what, as, as that man, as that rich man, seeing Jesus. I imagine, I imagine myself being excited about this new teaching, seeing Jesus and his disciples. And I, I go to Jesus. I'm so excited. I ask him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus the Christ is before me. I, I want to know, what can I do? And, and Jesus, Jesus and I, we talk, and he tells me that of the law of Moses, and he asks me, have I can, can, kept all these commandments? And of course I have. I've kept them since I was a boy. Jesus listens to me. He listens and he listens with love. And then he says to me, there is still one more thing that I must do. I must take all that I have. And I'm to sell it. And give that to the poor. And once I have done that, I may follow him. And with these words, I'm grieved. I'm grieved. I'm, I'm crestfallen. I'm a man of many possessions. And I don't know. I don't know how to part. I don't know how to part with them. As strong as my faith may be, taking that last leap and parting with every single thing that I have, it feels impossible. More impossible than any other, any other of God's commands. You know, I've spent my entire week praying and trying to look through the eyes 
of this rich man. Try to understand what he went through as he walked away so crestfallen. I thought about it all week. I think I've thought about this my entire life. What he is asked to do, and by extension, I am asked, we are asked as God's children. I feel that Jesus is really speaking directly to me here. Because I have many possessions. I do. I have, I have more than I need when clearly others out there have nothing. Whether it's, whether it's an entire, I would describe an entire wardrobe full of nothing to wear, extra guitars that I don't play, extra crockpots. I do not need extra crockpots in my life. And I try to bargain my way out of it. I make excuses. But I... The, the excuses, they're not real. Because I know what God, that God knows what's in my heart. And I think of that analogy that Jesus gave to his disciples as they are trying to understand what happened. As this man walked away and... Jesus gave them, yeah, Jesus gave them an, an analogy to understand it. And Jesus said to his disciples that, that it is, it's easier for the, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. And I imagine this, what Jesus is, what Jesus is, is saying to them. I mean, I mean, I mean, the eye of a needle. I mean, can you see this? I mean, I can't, and it's right in front of me. I have trouble threading a needle. And Jesus is saying that it's easier. Now, there, there, there are those, there are scholars out there who have, who have debated this section. And they've even said that, well, what Jesus is really talking about is not an actual eye of a needle, but more, you know, there, there are these, these, these doorways these, the, to get into Jerusalem, which were made deliberately, deliberately small, so it's difficult to get a camel through them, and that those were called the that was the eye of the needle, and to put the uh, you could not fit, and you could not have fit a, a camel through them. And all I'm thinking of is I think we're making excuses here, especially as I'm imagining scholars out there trying to reconfigure the camel so it can make its way through the eye of the needle. Whereas what Jesus wants us to do is to truly understand the impossibility of putting, just putting our own possessions before the sake of our humanity and hum human beings around us. And how in fact those possessions, they become their own weight. They weigh us down, they weigh our hearts, our minds, our souls, and that rather than try to fit a camel through the eye of a needle, maybe our lives, my life, needs, needs to change. And I think of the wealth in my own life. I mean, am I rich compared to some? 
Yes, I am. I'm rich in so many ways. I, th I think of my grandfather and his two sets of clothes. I think of my grandmother who fresh milk and caro syrup was a delight. It was a luxury. And then I remember my many possessions. You know, the like buying bag salad in the grocery store and then it goes bad and you have to throw it out. Yeah, many possessions. And it troubles me. You know, it certainly troubled the disciples when they, they asked Jesus, who then can be saved? And keep in mind, that when the disciples asked Jesus this, these were already men who had, they'd given, they had given up everything. They'd given up all of their possessions. They had left their jobs. They had left their families. They had left everything to follow Jesus in proclamation of the gospel, wherever it may lead. And Jesus' answer is so perfect and radiant. That with man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. All things. Because through our God, all things are made new. All things are brought into focus. All our gifts are provided for. Because our God gave up everything for us. Even his only son. So that we could have eternal life. Which brings me back to, oh, to this tiny needle. You know, as I continue to, to ponder, what, what do I do? What do I do with this bountiful life that God has given me? What do I do with these many possessions? What do I do? What can I do? I think of this tiny needle. And I think of those quilts. I think of those quilts and all, all the work that went into them. So many, many quilts. I think it was told 59 in total. All made with love. Handmade so they could be given to those in the most desperate, desperate need. Those who would not be warm otherwise. Refugees who have nothing, and families who have nothing. And I realized maybe rather than think of the camel, just think of, you know, what the eye of the needle can do. You know what? Maybe rather than try to, rather than try to pass a camel through the eye of the needle, I can thread the needle. I can thread the needle. And with that, I can do good work for those in God's world. It says, doesn't solve the issue of the many possessions. It's something I've got to continue to pray on. But in the meantime, I can thread that needle. I can give to God's people. I can give back to the creation that has given so much to me. And through God's guidance, give more and more each day. Because through God, all things are possible. Amen. Continue. I invite you to stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Encourage us to welcome the diverse benefits and blessings of the whole church and its teaching, preaching, prophecy, and healing. And remember to be guided by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nurturing God, you bring forth crops from the soil and bounty from the trees. Increase the produce of the land and bless all who toil in the fields and orchards. Provide for good working conditions and keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empowering God. You offer compassion to those who are overlooked or forgotten. Give healing and wholeness to all who are in need and all who are on our hearts today. We lift up our prayers for all that we know and those we do not know. We pray especially today for Dave McNeil, David Malky, Pastor Marty and Lola Rugi, Jody Porter, Connie Seidel, Claudine Ross, Brittany Rashman, Deb Jefferson, Laura Bartelt, Ryland Pruitt, Sally Bartz, and Bill Anderson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sheltering God, in Jesus you traveled among us without a place to lay your head. Provide safe places to sleep and rest for those who have no place to live. Sustain ministries that offer food, clothing, and peace of mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renewing God, you bring life out of death. Help us part with those things that are no longer beneficial to us and open our hearts to see where new life is budding in this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we thank you for the lives of those who have died. Make us confident in the promise of salvation and support us in your journey of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Wave to one another in celebration of Christ's peace and in the sure and certain hope that we will embrace once more. As our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gathered with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it always, so that you may remember me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God, show us how to resist all the forces of evil that once enslaved us. God, lead us deeper into your story so that it touches and gives shape to our everyday lives. Amen. 
Let us pray together now the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ given and shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into feasts of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Receive tonight's blessing. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God bless you now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.